September 11th, executive session. Uh, on September 11th, a special meeting on orientation for our student reps on September 18th. A regular board meeting from September 18th. Uh, our executive session on student discipline of September 19th. An executive session on property of September 25th. So I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. Right. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. All right, at this point, um, let's see, go on and uh, have um, visitors and correspondence recognition with our um, public relations director, Courtney Fisher. Oh, there she is. Courtney? Mm -hmm. Good 
Good evening, Madam Chairman, Trustees, Dr. Hal and Ms. Johnson, and our student representatives that are here also. Um, so tonight we kick off our um, first re recognitions for the year, um, for October. And so we have several recognitions to do tonight for the Cake Awards. Um, the Learner of the Month Cake Award recognizes two uh, Pocatello Chubbuck School District 25 learners per month, one elementary and one secondary from October through May. The Cake Award celebrates positive character and attitude, kindness and encouragement toward others. The recipients and nominating teachers are recognized here monthly at the Board of Trustees meeting. The learner recipients also receive cupcakes delivered to their classes and we're really happy that Benny the Bangle is going to be our new cake ambassador and he'll be joining us at our presentations this week. Um, so we'll take cupcakes to those classes and then the nominations for the cake award must be submitted by a teacher who has observed the nominee's behavior and must be approved by that school's principal. Our district believes a safe, supportive, caring and respectful environment is critical to student learning. The District Education Foundation, in partnership with McDonald's, supports the Learner of the Month Award to recognize students who show great character. So, our Elementary Cake Award winner will Miss Alexis Barchi. Please join me. And you can bring your mommy if you want. <laughs> so just come up here and stand right here in front of the podium, okay? Just right kind of to the side of it. Thank you so much for being here tonight. So, and Miss Rogers, is Miss Rogers here? Would you join us up here as well, Miss Rogers? Alexis is three years old and attends the Lincoln Early Childhood Education Program. In her nomination letter, Ms. Rogers wrote, Alexis, even at the young age of three years old, shows kindness toward her classmates. Recently, another young student started school feeling very apprehensive. Alexis sensed his uneasiness and comforted him by helping him take off his coat and hanging it up. Then she took his hand and led him into the classroom. Please join me in congratulating Alexis Barchi and our Elementary Learner of the Month for character, character, attitude, kindness, and encouragement. So I'm going to give you this certificate, Alexis, and you can take it home and put it in your scrapbook, okay? <laughs> so on Thursday, Alexis, stay here, don't leave yet, okay? On Thursday, Alexis will also be recognized in front of her peers at Lincoln Elementary School, and Benny the Bengal will be coming to your classroom to give you a shout out. And Alexis and her teacher will also receive a gift card from McDonald's. And your school library will also receive um, a $50 donation to purchase books in Alexis's name. So thank you so much. And if you would, would you please um, just go and meet everybody at this table and they'll shake your hand. Thank you so much. And you too, Miss Rogers. Oh, you can take pictures. Thank you, Alexis, for setting an example at your school. We appreciate that so much. Okay, thank you. Let's give her one more round of applause. Okay, now we have our cake award for our secondary learner. Uh, will Mr. Damiano Hochstrasser and his teacher, Ms. Patricia Covert, please join me at the podium? So in her nomination, Ms. Covert wrote, Damiano has been at New Horizons Center since he was in the fifth grade. He has had many challenges to overcome over the years. He attended the Idaho Youth Challenge Academy, successfully completing the program and earning 14 credits in the process. Damiano returned to New Horizon with a positive attitude and drive to complete his high school education. He has become a role model for other students, taking some under his wing to help him to also to help them to also be successful. He will finish block one of this school year with A's in all of his classes. On his current path, he will graduate with the class of 2019. We are all proud of Damiano for his accomplishments. Please help me uh, congratulate Damiano for all of his accomplishments and for the, being this October's uh, Learner of the Month for Secondary Education. Thank you, Damiano. So tomorrow, um, tomorrow 
you will be recognized in front of your peers during second period, and Benny the Bengal will be joining us to give cupcakes to, to your class so you can be recognized in front of the peers for the example that you've set. So thank you so much. And you also will both be receiving um, gift cards from McDonald's, as well as a $50 gift certificate for your library to purchase books in Damiano's name. So thank you so much. I have a certificate here for you. And congratulations, and you'll say let our board congratulate you. Thank you so much. And we appreciate everyone from New Horizon coming out to support Damiano. Thank you so much. Let's give him another round of applause. So next we have our October Employee of the Month, which is our PIES Award. Um, so the PIES, Employee of the Month PIES Award recognizes our employees who positively influence educational success. The award is for employees who go above and beyond in that effort. ISU Credit Union is our educational partner that helps us support this effort that we can um, provide this award on a monthly basis. Will Mr. Denny Carlson and Mr. Mark Holzer please join us at the podium? So Denny Holzer is our Employee of the Month, and he was nominated by Mr. Holzer. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Holzer. In his nom I'm just going to read the whole nomination letter because it was really something. In his nomination letter, Mr. Holzer wrote, Denny is an amazing man and an important part of our school and student's success. Not only is Denny the only daytime custodian here at Irving Middle School, but he also helps with many of our at-risk kids during breakfast and lunch. Remember, this school is over two city blocks long, has nearly 700 students, lockers and toilets to maintain, and along with maintaining our grounds, he has to help maintain Raymond Park across the street, even though we rarely, if ever, use it. In addition, Denny has to clean up all the trash every time Pocatello High School uses our football field for a game. Just another added responsibility. They don't mean to do that, do they? During the winter, the amount of snow shoveling and clearing is a daunting task, since the sidewalks wrap clear around our building and down the street to the bridges on both sides of the school. Denny also helps and has a huge impact on many of our at-risk students in our school. He accepts many students to serve their detentions with him during breakfast or lunch. He puts them to work cleaning tables, but then spends the time talking with the students about their behaviors and their futures. That time is so valuable because Denny treats each and every student with the utmost respect. He has kind and caring words for them and is absolutely non-judgmental towards them or their behavior. Denny has a special way to open the doors of communication between himself and these students and has the innate ability to change many of these students' attitudes, behaviors, and lives. Denny is a behind-the-scenes hero at Irving Middle School. He absolutely deserves to be recognized with this award. So Denny will be receiving a $50 gift card from the school district and a vacation voucher from our partner in this award, ISU Credit Union. And in addition for his nomination, Mr. Holzer is receiving a $20 gift card also on behalf of ISU Credit Union for nominating Denny. And I just want to say with our district's focus on visible learning, even though that's behind the scenes, you are an integral part of what that means to this district. So I just want to thank you and congratulate you on being this month's employee of the month. And that is for you. And if you'll say hello to our board, that is for you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have one more sort of recognition that really wasn't on the agenda till today, but um, today is National Bosses Day. So, and on behalf of the Pocatello Chubbuck School District 25 team, we'd like to take this time to recognize in front of the Board of Trustees and all of our guests 
someone who encourages, appreciates, and inspires the individuals working for him on a daily basis. Dr. Hall, would you please join us over here? <laughs> This was unexpected, right? <laughs> so what sets Dr. Hall apart in his role as the fearless leader of our district? I think anyone who has ever had a conversation with him will agree what a good listener he is. Dr. Hall is welcoming and approachable. He listens, processes, and is thoughtful in every decision that he makes. He gives people the chance and the voice to fully express their ideas, and he continuously demonstrates how much he cares about staff morale and the students in his district. Like the students in our district, Dr. Hall is a constant learner. Learning is at the heart of his job as superintendent, and it shows with his commitment to visible learning. When principals share stories about what happens in their classrooms, you can see Dr. Hall light up. These experiences these or experiences. Or cried. <laughs> Get a little misty. It's okay. These experiences energize him, and then he feeds that energy right back into his team um, and into those that he leads. Dr. Hal, thank you for guiding with insight and knowledge, recognizing accomplishments, and modeling thoughtfulness day after day. Please consider this as a token of our gratitude for all that you do to support District 25. It truly is the biggest pleasure to work for you. So, thank from our high schools. And I think we will begin um, today with Pocatello High School. And our student rep here today with Pocatello is Peyton Cates. And uh, so Peyton, do you want to go ahead? And <laughs> so a couple things we have going on at Pokey lately is coming up soon in the 26th, 27th, and 29th, we have our haunted house. So we make a haunted house downstairs in our hallway we use all the funds for that. We accept canned foods to get a dollar off on your admission. And we accept the canned foods because we donate the money that we get to Thanksgiving dinners for our students that can't afford it. So it goes to Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners for our students. So we also have um, hi our Hydrophonics Club has got yeah. the pumpkin seeds, plants with flowers, but seeds. I'm not sure what that's about. So I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, the mar our marching band got first in the 1A division at the ISU Mountain West competition, and second in the 1A division in the Utah and Mountain Topangos comp competition, and they received a best individuals in both competitions, so we're very proud of our band. Um, three students from Pocatello High School have their artwork included in the upcoming Idaho State Civic Symphony highlight. They were Sierra Fry, Arlie Reed, and Daniel Bennett, and they will be each receiving a ticket to attend the symphony and have their artwork included. And Pocatello, our government has been asked to present at the regional conference coming up next week at ISU. So we will be talking about our Make a Wish Foundation, and we have a teacher student, like a teacher faculty talent show that we put on, and we use all those funds to make a wish. So. Glad to have you here today. Okay, next we will go to Taylor Moore from Central High School. Okay, hello everybody, it's good to be here. So, our boys and girls soccer teams have both been awarded the Academic State Championship Award, and our girls swim team has also been awarded that. And our boys and girls soccer leave for state tomorrow in Boise. 
Um, this past weekend at the ISU Invitational, our band was awarded first place in visual percussion and music, and they were also they also won a state award for the highest scoring band in Idaho. They're pretty amazing. They are just so fun to watch and so full of energy. It's cool to watch them, and they do such a good job. Uh, our football won conference champions last Friday against Dominico. Uh, district volleyball game is this Thursday at Century. Our cross-country districts start tomorrow, and they're away at Wood River. We also had our PSATs on October 10th for our sophomores and juniors, but this was also a huge day for our seniors in getting ready for college. Um, <coughs> the seniors spent the day getting college ready, so we had 68 seniors just that day request transcripts to be sent out to colleges, which is pretty amazing this early in the year. We also spent time applying for scholarships and talking about graduation and the requirements. Our freshmen had freshman elections for student government that morning, and they went to a college career fair to get them thinking about their future also. We also had our seniors meet with their freshman buddies, so part of our senior sibling program. Um, the seniors got to talk to their freshmen about how they're doing this year, if they need any extra help, and we were also able to play a little game which was competitive and just made the day a little bit more fun. Um, this Friday, we're leaving to CSI for a college tour where, we'll be taking, where we will be taking about 50 students to tour the campus. And on our way back, we'll be stopping at the football game in Jerome um, that evening. So, also, one other thing I wanted to mention is our school officer, Officer Barchi, was here earlier, but he left. His daughter was recognized. Um, he did something super cool. So, he got these coupons from McDonald's and he had about 50 of them and some of them were just a free drink or a free meal and he handed them to our student government kids and said I want you to hand these out to students that you feel who um, might need a little extra pick me up in their day or to students who you see doing an act of kindness. So I thought this was super cool. Um, he handed these out yesterday and in student government today we talked about the effect that it had and just some of the experiences that our students um, were able to witness and be a part of. So one of them I just want to quickly share. There's this girl in our student government who saw someone who was quiet, not as outgoing, and she had her head down on her desk today. And um, she just walked up to her and said, hey, I have an extra gift certificate. Would you like it? And the girl looked up at her, and she just said, um, of course, she said, thank you so much. You made my whole day. And I just think that's an awesome representation of just how kindness is a chain. And when you see it, you want to be a part of it and you want to participate. And so I think it goes a long way. And especially in schools, we need that kind of, kind of thing. And it made our student leadership class want to be better and just want to spread more kindness. So um, I believe that is all I have to do. So thank you. Thank you, Taylor, <coughs> for sharing that with us. You know. Yeah, what you said is very true. Yeah. And then from New Horizon High School, we have Zane. Yes. Um, the first thing is our leadership class. This block is working on a tree the festival of trees. They're very excited to be doing that. We did one last year and turned out really great. We'll have to see what we end up coming with a class this time. Um, the float turned out amazing. A lot of the students loved working on it, loved seeing what they could accomplish and put together with when they sit down and do it. Being in a parade was amazing and an honor. It was really fun hearing people compliment our flow and just seeing what you can do in the public when you actually get together. Um, the pavilion outside, we love it. Um, being able to go outside while it's still warm and hang out other than just sit in the cafeteria. <laughs> other than that, really uh, nothing much going on. I mean, Domino or any cake or we probably have to have them in our school. Okay, thank you. You know, I, I think this is indicative. These are just a few of the things that are so indicative of why we're so proud of our schools and the kids there and the amazing, wonderful things that they do. And any of the rest of the board have any comments? Or okay. Well, uh, you are excused to go if you need to go, or you can continue staying through the rest of the meeting. That's up to you. We appreciate it. Thank you.
on our agenda is our comprehensive <laughs> annual financial report and our certification of our annual statement of financial correction. Mr. Reed is uh, Mr. Mr. Lenson. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Superintendent Howell. Appreciate the opportunity to take a few minutes and um, visit with you about our comprehensive annual financial report for this last year. Um, our independent auditors, uh, Mr. Lampson is uh, apparently a little bit late. Uh, I, I visited with him a little bit earlier this afternoon about 2 o'clock, and so I know, he, I know he knows about the meeting. Um, I'm not sure why he's not here, but you can give him a hard time when he shows up a little bit late, all right? But uh, I, I'm sure that he'll be here. I'll, go, I'll just go ahead and proceed with your permission, and then I think we'll, we'll uh, by the time I get through with what I'm uh, visiting with you about, I think he should be here. And if not, then we'll, we'll punt at that point in time. Yeah, uh, we are very happy. Uh, obviously, every year that we get to the point in time where we can um, present to you the report that we put together, our our report is approximately 140 pages, and so it's a very comprehensive um, document. It is required. Uh, it is required for all school districts across the state to provide a a financial report. Um, maybe not to this extent, but we have um, participated in in um, a couple of national reporting um, uh, programs that, that give greater transparency to everything that we do in the school district. Um, I, I think that you have all sat on the board or in these chairs long enough to kind of be familiar with the different sections of how it's paginated and, and how we um, work through the, the actual document itself. Um, the basic financial statements and schedules are report our financial position of the school district. I actually find the statistical section to be the most useful as far as kind of drawing comparisons between things over a given period of time or how things are actually um, working in our economy and, and in our local area. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned um, that we have participated for a number of years, actually 27 years now, we have participated in the government finances Government Finance Officers Association program and also the Associated School Business Officials. And um, we are the only school district in the state of Idaho who actually has received both of these awards consecu consecutively for this amount of period of time. Um, Mr. Reed, how long have you been? Just out of curiosity. Just short of 32 years now. Short of when I first came, um, we did not. We did not do a, a CAFR, what we call a CAFR, a Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And shortly after I came, um, we started doing that. So it's a, it's a lot of work, and maybe that's why um, some school districts don't go about doing that. But um, you know, when you go out for a bond like we did um, about 20 some odd years ago for Century High School and Pocatello High School, um, you save a little over a half a percent or sometimes even three quarters of a percent in interest sometimes. And so that has, adds up to hundreds of thousands of dollars over a 20 year period of time. So this has been very beneficial for us and also hopefully gives us some credibility that we are reporting the information as, as openly and as transparently as we possibly can as we, as we look at the operations of the district. Um, quite an achievement. Thank you. And, um, we have a great been, team that... Well, and I, I don't do it all on my own. We have a great team that, that uh, work at putting this together. And, um, you know, in all the years that I've been here, we've never had an audit exception. And uh, so we try to do things the right way and to be accountable to the public and to our, to our patrons. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to highlight a, a few things um, in brevity. If you have more specific questions, we can go over them. But um, this is in regard to our general fund revenues. Actually, our revenues, we had a very good year, one of the best years that we've had in the district. Um, the state has come forth with additional monies this past year and also this year as well. We are a little over $900,000 in, in revenues overall, or about 1% in excess of our budget estimates. Um, our interest earnings were up about $271,000 in interest rates. Uh, we actually bumped up our projections um, at the beginning of last year when we budgeted, but um, interest rates 
on the, on the lending side and also on the investment side um, continued to climb, and so we had a little bit more m money come in from that. Also, um, for our state appropriations through the State Department of Education, we were up about $443,000. That is a small increase in student enrollment over what we had initially projected there. And then our Medicaid revenues are up $212,000, and um, that's kind of a misrepresentation when you think, oh, well, we got additional monies for, for um, Medicaid revenues, but at the same time, we spent that on the other side for special education, and so that's a reimburse, reimbursable program. And uh, of that $212,000 that we received additional revenue, um, that represents about our share of 30% of the match for the Medicaid program. So on the um, expenditure side, oops, clickers, I gotta remember that it's back and not forward. Um, <clears throat> On the uh, expenditure side, our, our general fund expenditures were under budget about um, $1.7 million, or about 2.37% of our general fund budget. Our salary and benefits were within $240,000, and that's pretty remarkable when you consider that our salaries and benefits are nearly 64, 000, or 64 million, excuse me, dollars. We do an adjustment at mid-year in, in um, December and January when we bring our budget revisions back and so at that time we have our salaries and benefits a little bit more tied down in relation to where everything is settled out and so that's why one of the reasons why we're able to get as close as we are there. Um, our utilities last uh, week, a week ago from today, um, Mr. Brian Glenn <coughs> showed you a little bit of what we've been continuing to do by way of energy conservation. Idaho Power was here to talk about some of the incentives that we've done and we were um, just short of a half million dollars with our electricity, natural gas, and water as far as savings. And we continue to work in those areas there. Uh, you know, as we have looked at some of the earmarked funds that have come forward from the State Department of Education, that there are a lot more and, and a lot more plentiful earmarked funds that have come forth. One of those is in the area of professional development. And it's very difficult sometimes when um, the state pushes money in different areas, which we're grateful that they gave additional money for professional development, but there is only so much that you can absorb at one time as well. And so we were underspent there a little over $400,000. And then in the area of supplies and textbooks, we were underspent by just short of uh, $700,000 there. That's a little unusual, just so you know, for the year, we're usually much closer than that, but we had a very uh, busy year last year. We did a lot of new things. Um, a lot of professional development, a lot of uh, curriculum and textbook adoptions, but again, um, it has to come in a systematic and an orderly way in which we can implement that down through to the classroom and to the student. So, um, yes, I see Mrs. Uh, yeah, part. <laughs> what? Oh, we have the. Are you are you clapping for Mr. Orr or for our auditor? Our auditor. Oh, our auditor. <laughs> okay, they're going to give you a hard time, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> he has thick skin. All right. Um, our unassigned fund balance came in at $11,753,488. Um, that is the highest uh, fund balance that we have had for um, a considerable amount of time. And uh, a part of that is the, the savings that you see above there on the revenue side and on the expenditure side. And... Uh, we try to be very um, prudent and, and expeditious about how we spend taxpayer dollars. If they don't need to be spent, then we don't, um, we don't spend them for things that they don't need to be spent for. But at the same time, um, we have been able to keep our supplemental levy at $9.25 million for the last four years. You know, last year we had nearly, a, I want to say, eight or $900,000 increase in our medical insurance and our various insurances. And so even though that fund balance is higher than normal, um, costs continue to increase and go up year after year in, in all aspects of, of the school district operations. Um, even though that fund balance is, is over $11 million, um, that represents only 58 days of operation or short of two months. And uh, GFOA, under their new fund balance, and I've shared this with you before, um, suggests that a minimum of 5% or two months of operating revenues um, would be appropriate for, for local governments. And so we're just short of the, that two months of operations overall. On the um, 
this just shows the the fund balances for the general fund. You'll see that 11 million, 11.7 million dollars in the far right hand column there in the first section, and then the other governmental funds are our school plant facility funds, um, which is the 5 million uh, 613 thousand at the bottom there where it says assigned fund balances, and then we have our um, special revenue funds, and also. Um, which are a restricted category up there that we have some balances in. So overall, between all of our grants, our capital projects fund, and our general fund, um, a little over $19 million in reserves, if you will, there for all governmental funds. This uh, shows the governmental revenues by source. You can see that the state supports about 73% of the overall operations or revenues that come into the district. The other 16% is made up of local property taxes, which includes our supplemental levy and our school plant facility funds. It was higher when we had our debt service um, fund and our debts and our um, our bond levy, but that has expired a, a year ago. And so our our pie, the the sharing of that pie has changed a little bit now this last year. Also on the expenditure side, uh, this is fairly typical. About 63% goes to general instru instruction for our teachers and for students, etc. The support services that we talk about, which are uh, the custodians like we recognized here this evening, uh, a lot of our clerical staff, um, utilities and those sorts of things go into the support services. And then about 6% of our district is for capital outlay maintenance of our facilities and of our buildings. Um, these are expenditures for all funds, not just the general fund. So again, you can look at salaries and benefits um, for all funds uh, included, which is about 74%. If you just looked at the general fund total, that would probably be closer to 86, 87 uh, percent, somewhere around there. But this is all funds um, combined. In our statistical section, uh, these are some of the things that I just like to point out by way of our local economy, etc. Uh, you can see on the bottom line there that's uh, shaded under 2018. If you look about in the um, two thirds across where it says the total, you'll see three billion. $497 million of value. You can see that that's up from 2017 value. Not tremendously, so I think that some of the property values have um, leveled off a little bit, even though we continue to see a lot in construction and things of that nature. Um, the home homeowner's exemption is now fixed at $100,000. That used to be a variable. It would change year to year, but um, for the time being, they have indicated that that is going to remain fixed at $100,000 there. This is the um, principal um, property taxpayers in our community here. And the area in green shows the 2018, or our most current um, principal property taxpayers, like Union Pacific Railroad, uh, Great Western Malting, etc. cetera. Uh, they make up nearly um, $700 million in value, or about 20% of the overall total market value in, in Bannock County that we receive um, funding for. And if you compare that to 2009, you can see a little bit how Union Pacific was still was number three back in the day, but um, how that has changed a little bit over time. And the value was 322 million or roughly 11% back 10 years ago. So we've had quite a significant change of, of the principal uh, taxpayers and also the market value associated with some of those large uh, taxpayers, if you would. This shows our district enrollment trend, and you've seen this before um, over a period of time. And um, most recently, um, our enrollment, counting our Montessori and some of our Head Start students, was about 12,744 students. And you can see the section shaded there in, in blue is our, our uh, enrollment projection. And we're still relatively flat, maybe a slight decrease. Um, we are up a little bit this year in enrollment, but not significantly. In fact, the mix is a little bit different than what we thought it would be. So um, overall, we're going to watch that very closely because that's where our funding comes from. Uh, this is just def demographic and ef economic statistics um, to look at here, and um, two bars just to kind of compare last year to this year. Our population is up about 1,500, um, almost said students, but uh, 1,500 patrons or members in our community, which is a fairly significant increase from what we have seen in Bannock County over the prior uh, 10 years, if you will. Um, our school enrollment is also up uh, slightly this past year. And uh, one of the most contributing factors is last year we had our unemployment at about 2.8% in Bannock County. 
and it dropped another percentage or a tenth of a percent to 2.7 percent. While that is really great, that presents some real challenges um, in relation to keeping and, and hiring qualified staff because there just are not that many job seekers out there in the market uh, many times when we're looking to fill positions. So um, we watch that very, very closely, especially in relation to school lunch, our bus drivers, um, some of our classified staff that uh, we have a lot of turnover in. <clears throat> also, um, this is another interesting statistic here to kind of look at, our property and construction values. And this is between the city of Pocatello and the city of Chubbuck as well. Um, you can see as you walk down through there that in 2018 we had 197 actual permits that were issued through either Pocatello or Chubbuck offices for a value of about $34 million, in, and that's in commercial construction. Now that is lower than it was in 2016 when we had um, a higher amount that was coming from um, the hospital and also part of the western states um, that was starting to kick up, etc. If you look over on the um, residential side, you'll see that we have um, 265 permits that were issued. And that doesn't mean just new homes. It may be a remodeling project or a significant <coughs> remodeling project that would happen. But the significant part about that is that that number is up quite a bit from what it has been. The value, um, again, is greater than it's been over the last 10 years of sitting just a little over $22 million. So again, good indicators that the economy is recovering, that we're strong, things are going well, and that we're building new homes. Um, what is somewhat more unusual is that we haven't seen a lot more students in our, in our um, school system, but time will tell whether that will change and start to creep up or not. So we'll watch that very closely. Um, I think this is the last uh, graph that I have for you to look at, and this is just the educational um, information. We had um, roughly 681 teachers. You can see the various um, degrees of um, bachelors all the way through um, a doctorate or an ed specialist. Um, if you look down on the bottom, you see that little orange bar there. You can see that um, teachers with masters or a BA plus 36 or higher represent roughly 58% of our teaching community. So we have a very highly educated and qualified teaching staff in our district, which we're very proud of. Um, if you look at the bottom graph there that under years of experience, Another telling statistic is if you look at the first two lines, zero through four years and five through nine years, um, that represents 49% of our teaching staff. So roughly half of our teaching staff have been in our district less than nine years now. And uh, I can tell you that 10 or 15 years ago, that was very different statistic than what it represents today. But we're very proud of the people that we have in our district and their qualifications. Um, with that, you know, we're always grateful for our, our community that supports education. Without what they do in supporting our levies and, and uh, supporting our children and our school systems, we could not do um, what we're able to do in our school district. So uh, with that um, comes the meat and potato now, and, and that is our, our independent auditor, Mr. Lampson, representing Deaton and Company. And uh, he is going to talk about his um, opinion and the work that they did this year and after he finishes, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to entertain those questions. So, sure. Well, thank you. I, I thought I made it on time, but it uh, looks like things are moving quite quickly, and, and uh, I'll try not to slow anything down. Uh, I'll try to keep it going. Um, one thing I have learned in this world is there's um, really only three kinds of people in this world, the, those who can count and those who cannot. So um, I hope that doesn't uh, maybe a little less appropriate before I give you my opinion on the financials. <laughs> but no. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Bart, for, for that introduction. My name is Doran Lampson. I'm with Deaton and Company. And we did um, perform the financial statement audit for the school district 25 for the year ended June 30th of 2018. Uh, in doing so, the financial statements that, uh, that will be presented or, or have been presented uh, are, are the responsibility of management. And they're responsible to ensure that these financial statements are presented um, uh, fairly and correctly um, in a, 
in accordance with uh, generally accepted accounting standards. As auditors, our responsibility is to go in there, perform analytical procedures, evaluate controls, um, perform risk assessments, uh, and additionally, we we do sample testing, and and we perform our audit in accordance with uh, generally accepted government auditing standards. And, and in doing so, we're required to perform um, various procedures, as discussed um, momentarily ago, that uh, that allows us to provide our opinion on these financial statements. And the opinion that we are providing on the financial statements are that these financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects. Um, and that being said, it's considered a, uh, the term is an unmodified opinion, uh, meaning uh, we did not find uh, any uh, material issues that were not corrected or, or not um, reported. Uh, in addition, because this is a governmental um, audit, financial statement audit, we're also required to provide a report on the internal controls uh, and compliance within um, govern, governing uh, agencies and um, granting agencies. Because, because this school district has federal grants that exceed $750,000, the school district is also required to, to be subject to the Single Audit Act, which we have also performed. In doing so, we're required to test internal controls um, over compliance of various federal grants and, or excuse me, of over major programs that uh, that were tested. Um, in doing so, we did not find um, any deficiencies or significant deficiencies over internal controls, um, nor did we find any non-compliance with those federal programs and grant uh, programs. Um, also, in addition to uh, the governmental uh, reporting, there's um, two reports that are there. Uh, I've already disclosed uh, our, our findings on the single audit, which were also an unmodified opinion, meaning we, we did not find any compliance uh, or control issues uh, with the school district on the federal programs. Uh, in addition, we provided a report over uh, the governmental, uh, as a governmental agency as a whole, and once again, not, did not find any issues of, of significant deficiency or a material weakness in internal controls, and we found no issues of noncompliance with the government as a whole. Uh, that being said, we do not provide an opinion on, on the controls of the entity, but we let you know that as we perform our testing, if we do find issues, um, whether or not we found deficiencies. Um, and that being the case, uh, we also want to uh, express uh, gratitude for Bart Reed and his staff and Mr. Howell for their assistance during our audit and their staff and their assistance um, in, in making sure that we have all the supporting documentation and evidence required to provide our opinion. Uh, we also want to share our congratulations to the school district uh, 25 for, for continuing to obtain um, both awards through ASBO and, and GFOA. Uh, and we also want to thank you guys for allowing us to assist in the audit um, once again for the School District 25. Uh, at this time, if there's any questions or concerns you'd like to ask, I'd be willing to accept those. I don't think so. Well, that's even more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Try this seating arrangement today. <laughs> Options. So, thank you. Um, so, this is the meeting community relations report for um, October. Since the last board meeting on Tuesday, September 18th through today, Tuesday, October 16th, there have been 46 media stories, and I emailed you um, a link to that document with all of those stories. Eleven of those stories are district specific. Uh, 
news articles and, and stories. Um, the other 35 are regional and national stories that, you know, we like to keep tabs on the trends of, you know, what school districts, what's going on regionally and nationally in education. So I think those are important to, to keep tabs on, so that's why we do that. Um, some of the local headlines and coverage of interest included um, the Sleep in Heavenly Peace bunk bed build. If you get a chance to watch that interview, they built those bunk beds last um, Friday and Saturday. There were 60 of them that were built and delivered to kids who some, can't, Mr. Hobbs was describing the event to us, and, and some of these kids have never slept in a bed, um, and, and multiple children in the household. So that is just a phenomenal program that, that the district is very blessed to be a part of. Um, also in the news were the improvements to Pocatello High School, um, the state superintendent of public construction election race, which will continue to be in the news until November 6th um, and thereafter. And then um, a really positive story was the monthly District 25 school board tour that um, Mr. Vitale and Lori, Ms. Lori Craney and I um, went on at Idahau. Um, so I, I really appreciate that opportunity to, that you coordinated for us, Mr. Vitale. I, th I think it, it was um, shed some really positive light on what, was, what is going on in our district and, and what you do behind the scenes. Um, so graciously with, with your time, and I think that's really important to show our stakeholders the amount of time and commitment that you all have um, to this endeavor and making this school district as, as amazing as it is. Um, and also, we, um, I think Dr. Hal shared with you the Go Noodle Plus story that was on KPVI last night, twice, and then again uh, this morning, and we had some in... Um, in studio visits this morning with Mrs. Goff from Taihee Elementary, as well as Mr. Johnson's daughter, Jaylee, um, who I think said one word, dancing. <laughs> but it was, it was a great story, and, and that really allows us to give Portland of Health Trust the visibility that they deserve for generously um, gifting that program through, through the Portland of Health Trust grant process to us. Um, also interesting to note, if you check it out in that, um, in one of those links, is a story about Idaho Education News and East Idaho News are going to be partnering on a regular news video segment spotlighting local and uh, statewide education issues. Why I thought this was interesting is because um, East Idaho reporter Devin Bodkin is going to be helping produce those videos, and so I think that that's an opportunity to really reach out to him and kind of highlight some of the things going on in Pocatello School District 25. Um, a lot of East Idaho news or, or Idaho education news is focused um, in Ada County. So, you know, having that touch point here in East Idaho, maybe we can get a little bit more coverage from, from them. But the segment's going to be called Beyond the Books, and it's going to provide commentary and analysis on the education news in both East Idaho and from across the state. So we'll be closely monitoring that. Um, that story was published on October 4th. And in that story, it said that the first story would be pu published the following Monday. So do the math. They haven't published a story yet, so we'll, we'll still be watching that. Um, in terms of social media, we increased the number of individuals following us in the last month by 32. It's, it's a slow climb, but it's still climbing. Um, we've got 7,328 people that follow our page. Of those 7,328, 6,721 like the page. So a lot of people follow. Um, so that's kind of my goal, to get those numbers to match up a little bit more evenly. Um, in that time period, our page has been viewed 1,616 times. We had 46 posts on Facebook with a total reach of 11,264. Um, and then our video views were 952. These numbers are down slightly from last month, even though we had two more posts. Than, than we recorded last month, so I'm going to be looking at the numbers to see. You know, you can, Facebook has some pretty great analytics where you can see what, perf, what posts performed well, um, and you can generally get an idea based on the content, what's working with our audience and what's not working, and we'll try to replicate those posts um, to get that positive feedback sustained um, for, for what we're doing on social media. Um, we also, Twitter is, is a really slow climb, but we are continually tweeting and not slowly uh, growing as well as Instagram. And then um, we'll con continue to build our presence using diverse social media channels, and it, that's just going to continue to be an area of focus for me over the next year. 
Um, another thing that I'm looking into, and, and Joel's been out sick, so I haven't gotten an answer on this, but whether or not we have Google Analytics plugged into the back end of our, our new website, and that will give us an opportunity to really see um, what our website traffic is, what pages people are going to um, the most frequently, how much time they spend on those pages. So that, that gives us a really great opportunity to understand what our stakeholders need and what they're looking for. So hopefully I'll have a, um, a more detailed report on, on what those numbers look like next month. We don't have the information on number of hits or anything like that now? With Not that I am aware of, no. Unless the unless the website provider offers some sort of analytics, but really, my recommendation is that we get Google Analytics on there. And, mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, and then in terms of community outreach, um, deep into the planning of Festival of Trees, I think I counted five weeks out, so I'm going to take a deep breath. Um, and move forward from that. Um, we've opened up several new sponsorships that I'm really excited to roll out. The gala tables are nearly sold out, um, with people still calling every day to see if they can get a gala table. So I'm, I'm, I have a few more, but I'm, I'm reaching that, that threshold level on those. And then um, I've also reached out to open up more advertising and promotion channels. We've got a couple of new sponsors in terms of advertising to get us um, just more publicity and more promotion for, I'm hoping to grow the general admission this year. And I think by having um, Jeeves Ads is one of those partners that we're going to, and they have TV screens in most restaurants that you'll go to, Gold's Gym, um, the tire stores, and it's just a constant rotating um, advertising screen. We can change the message, and I think that will give us a really great new avenue. Um, I've had a lot of success with using those screens in the past for other for other things. Um, ticket sales go on sale November 1st. And then if you'll please um, mark your calendars to attend the grand opening, that will be held on Tuesday, November 28th. Any questions? Yes, you have a table. <laughs> yes, your table is reserved. All right, if there aren't any other questions, that concludes my report. Let us know if we can help anyway. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I think all of us would be willing to help forever. The great thing is there is there is a there is a wealth of institutional knowledge in terms of the committee that works on this event. So I don't know what I don't know until I go through <laughs> until I go through it. So, you know, it's it's been pretty smooth sailing so far. And and the community is really invested in this event. So you you call the sponsors who have sponsored last year and they you know it, it's not really a sell, it's a how can we help, so. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative, we're at the point for report on standing committees. Who's that? That's I think that's just a really valuable way to find out what needs to happen to support kids in the community. That's what that's really about. And then, not too long before I left home, I got a note from Karen Echevarria with the IHSAA um, announcing the uh, state academic champions. And we heard a couple of those, but um, girls soccer and boys soccer from Century um, were academic champions, as well as girls swimming from Century. So they're up there. And then Highland football was the state academic champion. So those are good things to know about our kids. I, I went to Key Communicators this last um, couple weeks ago, I guess, wasn't it? Like, but um, it was interesting, uh, Mayor Blad, the mayors were there. They had a really good attendance. And um, they, they gave some added insight in that to um, how we can promote maybe uh, our levies a little bit better and, and use, um, his one idea was that to use um, how much money we save parents through dual scholarship enrollment and through, through, uh, through cost for college, that we save them all this money and so they should be more than willing to, to uh, uh, 
kind of uh, help us what, be in favor of a, of our levies and things. But but it was it was kind of interesting to hear their take on that. So that was that was something I thought was a little different, and that they don't usually have to say much. You know? <laughs> so, but they had some definite opinions. So, anyway. Okay. Anything else? Okay. And uh, now, at this point, we'll go to the instructional technology update with Mr. Orr. Good evening. You have the Tech News Newsletter in your packet, which um, this month is pretty self-explanatory, so it's there for your information. Um, I did want to make board members aware that um, in the recent past, the, that Idaho adopted K-12 computer science standards. A subcommittee um, to help address these, a subcommittee of the Instructional Technology Committee will be meeting to review and then develop a recommendation that will include how these standards um, can be implemented at each level in elementary, middle school, and high school. Related to that, um, Idaho has also required that by 2020, high schools must offer a computer science course. Um, the course won't be required for graduation. It just has to be offered as, as part of our curriculum. We've had discussions with Idaho State University and most recently with Paul Bodley in computer science and Jonathan Holmes, the assistant professor for informatics, about the possibility of offering dual enrollment computer science on our high school campuses. Uh, these discussions are in their infancy and we always, obviously have many details left to work out, but we're excited about the possibilities and the partnership with ISU. Um, our subcommittee will ultimately present recommendations back to the Instructional Technology Committee and potentially District Curriculum Committee later this school year. So we'll keep you updated with um, any recommendations um, that we end up presenting to one or both of those committees. That's interesting. I just, I just talked with a young man and he just got his doctorate in infor informatics. I hate to tell you, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I just had never heard that particular term, but, you know, so it's... We had to ask also, and um, uh, Jonathan Holmes told us it was basically computer science in the business realm. Correct, Jan? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so. was, it was a new term for me. Yeah. So. Informatics does a lot with the data manipula manipulation and displaying data. All right, moving to item B then, um, the report on our October professional development. We actually had a, a fairly busy week that week, um, and we actually started on October 3rd and uh, provided training for our teachers who teach integrated math um, at the middle school and at the high school level. So they engaged in a full day of training on the 3rd. October 4th, then, we, we had training for all of our um, high school teachers who are teaching integrated math, too. Uh, we also had a half-day training that day for our high school Spanish teachers on the Spanish program that we adopted last school year. So. Uh, we had a trainer come in from uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt who provided that for that group of teachers. And then uh, we had quite a few teachers um, from the high school level that came in for a half day um, on the morning of the 4th for SAT training. And that training was provided by uh, two people from the college board. We had our English, language arts, math, social studies, and science department chairs and other interested teachers um, attend that training. The SAT provides subtest scores that measure a learner's ability to read and analyze social studies and science content. So the training provided um, strategies to teachers that would support learner achievement on the SAT in reading, math, social studies, and science. So um, it was a pretty good informative training that morning. <clears throat> then on uh, Friday, October 5th, we 
invited Keith Orchard back. Uh, you'll recall that we had him here for our opening professional development in um, August. And um, he provided continued training on creating a trauma-informed classroom. Our secondary staff met for three hours in the morning, and then our elementary staff met for three hours that afternoon. And they learned how trauma affects the body, what to do about sensory processing issues, and tier one strategies to increase calm as well as uh, reactive strategies. Um, and then for your information, we, we have Mr. Orchard coming back to the district November 29th and 30th, and he'll be working with um, a smaller group of people. Um, our schools will bring teams with them uh, from their schools, and he'll, the focus of that training will be more on tier two strategies for, for those learners who have been impacted by trauma in their life. So. Um, you know, it, it's a sad topic, but it's very, very pertinent uh, with regard to what our teachers and our administrators um, are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I, I did hear from uh, several elementary teachers. They thought it's one of the best trainings they had ever been to. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. You know, it's been very informative. They've learned a lot. He's, he's a very engaging uh, speaker, great trainer as well. So. <coughs> we appreciate hearing that. So are those, is that training open if we want to listen in? Is Absolutely, yes. The 29th and, th and the 30th. Um, I don't know that we've established the exact times yet, have we? Um, maybe Renee could inform us of when that is. Just yeah. remind us. So unless you have any questions, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Roy. All right, thank you. This is Greeny. Let's start program update and set the letter. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. So first of all, for the Head Start Board Report, the ERSI Report, for enrollment, the program is at full enrollment, 183 students. There are three four-year-old children withdrew from the program. One child moved, one child had no transportation, and one child went back to child care full time. I think it's good that they're tracking those reasons. I think we always wonder if transportation, what, a, what impact it has. 31 applications are on the four-year-old waiting list, 12 applications are on the three-year-old, and they're continuing to take applications. For the average daily attendance was 93.46%, and the program will begin to look at chronic absenteeism in November. For personnel, there are two positions that are open. They had health managers last day was October 12th, and they conducted interviews today for that position. And until the position is filled, the Head Start coordinator and the other managers are overseeing that position. The Lincoln Food Service Cooks last day is October 22nd. That position is currently posted on the website. Both employees moved on to higher paying jobs with full-time employment. The program has hired a new food service cook, Janine Grace at Taihe, and her first day was October 9th. Policy Council, a new Policy Council was seated on October 11th. There are 18 new and two returning parents on that um, Policy Council, and there are five community representatives. And the program is working on the application for the supplemental funding. The grant application will be presented to the board at the November board workshop for review and <coughs> input and considered for approval at the November board meeting. So that's for Head Start. Did you say yeah. uh, we don't have a board uh, work? Work session on Ooh, that'll be. Well, you know what? Then we'll just figure yeah, out what might, we're going to do yeah. there. How about that? Okay, good. I'll have her. We'll get in contact with her for that. Yeah, that one slipped right by me, and I knew that. I just saw that come through. Well, oh, if the board chooses to not have, then we will relook at it. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> okay, and uh, after school program started October first. Uh, as of the last, as of last Thursday, they have what, 204 out of 260 students enrolled. So 
I'm pleased. I was up at Jefferson today, and they have 40 students that are enrolled and in the program with the waiting list already. And he said, oh, yes, we got off to a slow start and didn't add all 40 at once. And I thought, we're only a few weeks into this. So it is a very vibrant program up there, um, you know, at all the schools. But I, I'm thrilled to see that we're able to have one there at Jefferson. They really do take advantage of making sure that those slots are filled there and have some great things going. They're fully staffed, and they're, they're having a lights-on celebration on the 25th of October, where this, the learners will be teaching their parents how to do paper circuits and making light-up Halloween cards. So I'll have her get an invitation out to you, because those are always fun events. We were able to start the backpack program. They had a half a month there in September, so you'll know that 307 um, backpacks were, food backpacks were distributed. We will be updating the contact person list that is out of date. So if you notice some people there that have retired, yes, I'll have Mel Melody uh, Hanula is the one that is keeping track of those for us this year. So it was, they were ready to get started with that program. That really shows what a great need that there is because they were really looking forward to it. Next in there is the Pocatello Community Charter School, um, the framework. And you'll just note that I just updated it so that we would know kind of where we're standing rather than the certificate is up in June, but that way it gives us a heads up on where we are without um, something kind of going, uh, us not paying ten attention to beforehand. So you'll note that one of the, uh, there are a couple of areas on this one, and I did add a code up at the top of there, anything in this um, framework there that is gray are sections that will be deleted because they based on accountability systems or redundant wording and so they're ones that we'll be getting rid of and we'll be adding the yellow when we do redo the framework when we look at it in, in terms of the performance certificate. It almost looks like they were using like the old stars framework. It, they were. That's what when we started with the performance framework that's exactly what we started with. Then we didn't use the framework and then we started to add some more account, go back and add some in there. We will all, we will be looking to add in our new accountability system, but I'm waiting just a bit to add that in because I know that the commission, the Charter School Commission will be um, creating a framework and we'll be able to pull from there to uh, put in more of their, the accountability, the current accountability system where we have um, looking at, you know, all the different aspects and all of the indicators there. So we'll be working on that and watching for that. We did use that, their, their math was, um, both of their areas in ELA and math on the ISAT were above the state average, and I did, some, my math was incorrect on there. They were two and seven tenths points above the, above in the state in the math average, and 10.1% percentage points above in ELA. And I know that Mr. Mendai did recognize that math is their area where they, you know, where they are working and where they note that there's continual need. Also in here, just a couple of areas in there that, that we note, um, they're still continuing to work on adopting policies and procedures, and uh, Mr. Mindive reports that, that that's been the work of their, uh, of their uh, governing group. And so it's not done. He said they've made progress, but they're still not there yet. And that he knows that they can call us Yep, there is a note in there, and he did say that they're now a member of the ISBA and they've been receiving training and support. So there you go. Yeah, so I'm glad to know that they're, you know, they're calling on them. The other one that where they do not get the points is their lack of transportation, of transporting their students. So that one will probably continually be an area where they do not receive all of the points. When it's summarized, they have 72% of their academic points, 96% of their operational, and 100% of their financial. And you heard from their report at the work session, they're getting it pretty solid in their financials, their, their practices, and and even their um, savings has really been increased, and we're glad to see that and glad that they're really taking that into consideration. Okay, any questions? On? Oh, and in the addendum, there's the letter that I will be sending to them that just summarizes all of this and lets them know where we are. I think also Mr. Reed also creates a letter that goes with them on their financial report. So we try to follow up with that every year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
be happy to know I'll be brief. So uh, the first thing in your packet is policy 8705 on student activity and participation fees and student fines. And the changes to this policy are, are just the, um, the addition of swimming as in our list of extracurricular curricular activities that require a participation fee, as well as some clarification for parents and legal guardians regarding liability for unpaid fees, fines, and unreturned property and the potential to be taken to collections should those um, not be addressed. And this, uh, the board will be asked to hear the policy on second reading under old business and we did not receive any input from the public on this particular policy. The next item are the out-of-state overnight travel requests. There are just two, one for Highland High School's band and one for the outdoor club at, at uh, Century High School. In both cases, we have the appropriate number of chaperones and the right genders for our chaperones. Under the one law, it says three rentals. Is that the name of the place? Or it's actually condominium kinds of oh. rentals. Yeah, so. Uh, the, ne the next item is the camp reconciliation report, and this is the report um, for all of our camps that were held through 2017-18, and it's um, in a spreadsheet. I don't know if it's a great explanation, but I'm going to tell you the explanation because I was struck by that too. So. Um, there's always been a question, Mr. Reed will disagree with me here, but there's been some question about, about um, what's a camp and what's a fundraiser. And um, Highland High School, who has had some experience with this and the need for this reconciliation report, um, really follows what, what was established a, a number of years ago, probably eight years ago, that determined that any time a skill is being taught, it's a camp. And, um, and so that's why Highland High School has everything. There are the camps for, let's say, a Highland High School football player as well as the camp for uh, middle school and elementary students who, who participate in a football camp. And you'll see that um, all the way through there, like Little Ram Wrestling. Um, and so it's, it's their own students as well as younger students. And in the cases of Century and Pocatello High School, they, um, they don't run as many, and some of theirs that they classified as fundraisers, and I approve them as fundraisers rather than camps, and, and we'll clean that up for this school year, but that explains some of the discrepancy. And I'm going to tell you the other thing that um, is pretty evident. Highland has figured out that this is how you, you build programs, and this is how you build funds for programs. And so, 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 you know, this is Mr. Bell's expectation that, that rather than sell something, we, we provide skills for um, learners throughout the district. And, um, and so I think that also is evident in, in this particular report. A little more equitable somehow, and because I, I saw it's twice as many reporting, or a little more than twice as many. How would you expect them to do it more equitably? Highland's just doing more, period. It's just a, or, it's or, just or it could be not reflected in here. It, it could yeah. be that Century ran, you know, I'm going to make it up. It's probably Pocatello High School who ran a volleyball clinic on a Saturday for middle school girls and and. I approved it as a fundraiser. It should have been approved as a camp, so it would be reflected here. So I, I have, you know, I'm fairly certain that happened. So we need to fix that. We, we will. What were you going to say? Well, you said the uh, ADs, there's a lot of egos there. Yes, they, they work really well together, but <laughs> they do work really well together. I just would like to see, I know, and Highland has a whole lot more students, I realize that too, but I still would like to see it 
more equitably. You know, a, a, equals as much as we could. A really good example of of this is, um, uh, geez, it was it was the weekend of October fifth, sixth was that Saturday, and. Um, Highland ran a JV volleyball tournament that weekend. And, and you know, they're just willing to go out there and go after that kind of funding. You know, it takes a lot, it takes a lot of work, and you have to have your volleyball coaches willing to put in the time, and you have to be able to find the officials that you need, and, 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 and they know it's a, it's a money maker, and, and it also provides opportunity for JV volleyball players and so we just need to I think work with all the other two high schools to make sure that they recognize that this is a fundraising um, opportunity that also builds builds skills and program for the for the district wide another example is we've always done the the Fleischmann wrestling tournament at Pocatello High School and Irving Middle School has traditionally done the, the Irving Middle School invite for wrestling and and it's a lot of work and Irving decided this year that they just have more on their plate than they can manage and so they they turned that you know they said you know that weekend is open if somebody wants to do something and so uh, Pocatello High School jumped on that and so they're calling it the Pocatello High School Classic and it's for middle school students and I um, the one at Irving had only been for you know, middle school varsity, if you will, and I believe they've tried to expand it so that it'll be, it'll involve more wrestlers. And so I think the other two high schools um, are jumping on this, and I already have um, Mr. Anderson at Century mad because he didn't know about that free weekend <laughs> and that opportunity. So I think there's, they're paying attention, and um, and I think we'll naturally see it, but I will make sure that we're approving camps as anything that involves teaching our our learners a skill throughout the district as a camp, and we and that will address some of this inequity. And that we can encourage some of those opportunities too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the last item in in your packet from me is the assurances, the, the or the the document that are the assurances between the Idaho State Department of Education and the Pocatello Chubbuck School District relative to the Comprehensive Support and Improvement, CSI, UP school funding. And um, this is essentially the um, funding that will be provided to Kimport Academy to address um, some, some, their school improvement planning. And at this point in time, what we've been told, it's $50,000 a year to support um, some efforts on the part of Kimport Academy. And I um, took the time to call Mrs. Prescott to to ask, you know, where where are we on this? Um, Mrs. Prescott took her leadership team from Kimport, along with um, Mrs. Kinghorn from Title One and myself, to a training in Boise where we were told how much money and and um, some of the rules regarding how that money will be spent. And, and we also have a capacity builder that's been assigned to, to Kimport, and he will be meeting monthly with Mrs. Prescott. And there is what's called a Zoom meeting, which is just a webinar kind of meeting that's interactive with the State Department on Friday. And, um, and that's when, when Mrs. Prescott will, will be paying attention to what are the kinds of things that, 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 w that might make a difference for Kimport in addressing their ISAT reading, ISAT math. And we know that those students um, are at Kimport because they have had significant behavior challenges and consequently suspensions. And so we have gaps in learning. And so it, we're, we're looking to see just what might be a plan that will address that. And um, Mrs. Prescott and I are going to meet with Kath Kathy Lewis and Mr. Orr, along with Kimport's building leadership team, to talk about some possible software that might help um, fill fill holes that students have, and and then also allow those teachers then to continue to make sure that that these students continue to grow while they're at Kimport. So that's what those assurances will help us do. Okay, thank you.
<laughs> well, the good news is that we're in almost exactly within a few million dollars of where we were at last year after the first three months with the state. So, um, you know, each of the three months have just been slightly below their, their estimated budget, but um, overall they're about $13 million below their um, budget estimate or about 1.4%. But again, if you go back and do that in comparison to last year at this point in time, we're almost equal with where we were. And, and we had a great year last year um, with, this, with the state. So I don't think we can be overly disappointed. We just may not be as overly optimistic as where um, we had hoped that we might be. So um, a good report overall. Uh, the, the, the great news is that that it's not significantly different or under from what the state has projected. So we'll hope for good things there. The next item is the eligibility percentages for our um, food service program on free and reduced meals. And I think this actually went up just um, slightly from where we were at last time. We were sitting about 48.75%, so that's good um, overall. And uh, I know that the folks in the schools and also in food service program have been working very, very diligently to identify and help families um, be eligible for any benefits through that program that they might be eligible for. So um, it's been running very well so far. Um, item C is the Idaho School Boards Association and we from time to time through the ISBA insurance plan um, depending upon if they have a good year or a bad year may receive a dividend back and we received back $14,000 um, $654, so we'll just offset that back against our our premiums that we pay, and it'll just go back to as a credit. So, Is that um, about what we got last year? Uh, you know, I don't remember actually what we received last year. It seemed like it was even less than that. If I remember, I, I seemed like it was maybe three or four thousand yeah, dollars. It, it was not as big of an amount, and um, well, part of that was because um, all of the damage that happened right up in the prior. up in the Boise area, right. So we Many dividends this last year wasn't so bad. Yes. But, but uh, Weezer last year, the year prior, we got slammed as well as some other places. So I think that's why. I do believe that you're correct in that respect. Uh, the next item is an is, uh, item we've kind of already talked about, the response to our financial audit report from the um, Pocatello Community Charter School. I don't think there's any surprise there in the language of the letter. Um, I think overall um, they had a very good year, as we did and uh, we don't really find any exceptions or any strong recommendations other than that they continue to do the best they can and, and uh, keep a strong financial position. So they're doing okay there. We'd recommend that the board would approve that letter under, I believe it's under old business, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, the next item, which is item E, is our annual request to um, bid various projects for our capital improvement program. You can see uh, the large list alphabetically there from um, asphalt, boilers, to roofing, um, vehicles, etc. cetera. Uh, we do this primarily so that we can get out ahead of the time to secure bids and to um, bring them back to the board before the bid market gets really strong and, 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 and saturated, if you will. It, it, it honestly saves us um, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to get out of the chutes first and to try to get going on this. So if we would ask that you would approve that under new business. And then um, lastly, I just wanted to uh, just let you know that we have been kind of following some of the new and proposed subdivisions between Pocatello and the Chubbuck area. Um, I don't know if there's anything really earth shattering to share with you. As part of our financial report, you know, we indicated that there were 265 new uh, residential home permits, whether that's a remodel or a brand new home. Uh, and that's that's a higher number than we've seen in the last 10 years. So um, we are seeing more and more. This is probably not a real accurate, but just let me just give you a reflection of what we've seen kind of come across the school district here uh, from the city of Pocatello. And again, this may not be a totally accurate number, but just based on the information that we have right now. Um, between homes or um, apartments like uh, fourplexes or duplexes and things of that nature, in Pocatello, we've seen roughly 350 to 370 proposed improvements or, or buildings. So some of these plans may be we're proposing a 35-unit subdivision, but it may take 
five years for that to fill or, or longer or maybe shorter. We don't know. Uh, and that's from um, the city of Pocatello. From Chubbuck, we've, we've seen roughly uh, 230 to 250. So the number isn't quite so important as it is that we've, we're seeing a lot of movement of proposed building, whether it's this next year or over the next two to three or four or five years, we are seeing movement in that direction, which is a very positive thing in our community. So uh, we'll continue to watch that if there are specific areas that may impact specific schools. Um, then, then you know, we'll we'll have to watch that very closely because um, some of these projects, most of these projects, don't impact any one particular school. Um, they they impact the district as a whole, but some of these areas may impact a specific school, such as an elementary school or um, possibly a middle school or something like that. So, um, as that as that information becomes available, or as we see those sorts of things, um, we'll try to to share that with you to the greatest extent that we can. Dr. Hal, did you want to say anything? You had that look on your face like maybe you wanted to add something. No, I but, think uh, you picked it up, Mr. Ian. Okay. You talked about it earlier when we were looking at our growth, mm -hmm. the uh, projected growth. Yes. And it is just flatline. I mean, we watch that weekly, biweekly, uh, or every other week. Yes. And, uh, you know, barring something just exploding, we're uh, <coughs> doing well. We're managing mm -hmm. uh, the learners that we have. And yeah. The, in the facilities that we presently have, and right. with some projection for anticipated growth based upon what we see happening and what our community leaders tell us. Yeah. Is it, it, was, it picked up as as if the charter schools are taking up extra kids, but when I look at those numbers, they aren't changing they aren't that changing. much. You well, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I visited with Mr. Uh, Love, Gerald Love, who's the principal at Tim Prep. Uh, Academy uh, just last week, and he said that uh, they were looking at expanding their first through third grades, adding one additional classroom in each of those primary grades, and then uh, one seventh grade and one eighth grade classroom next year. So that uh, won't have a significant impact on the district and may you know, uh, keep us about the same, mm -hmm. slightly less or slightly more, again, depending on growth. Well, and I was just going to add to what Dr. Howell said there. I think that the important thing for us as a school district to understand, and especially for our community to understand as well, is that at the present time and, and into the near future, our building capacity from elementary to middle school to high school, especially after going through the secondary boundary um, revision that we did here some time ago, we, we are able to handle the students that we see in the near future. Now, unless something majorly changes or upsets the apple cart there, um, we're, we're in a position that we can continue to use the available facilities that we have before us and fit students in those schools and run, uh, you know, a great educational program. Now, um, that doesn't mean that things won't change, but for the near future, we're, we're very well positioned for that. So I think that that's important for especially the public to understand because there's a lot of rumors floating around there about we need this or we need that, but we have to look at the data. We have to look at the seats that we have in our chairs in our district and even in our charter schools that we have in our community because they eventually filter back into our system. And for the, for the time being, um, we're in a good position. So... Uh, we watch that very, very closely because we don't want to be caught behind the eight ball saying, oh, wow, um, we need to have a new school here in six months. I mean, we'd never want to be in that position, but we're very careful to kind of continue to monitor that and to continue to look at it. So, I was wondering that the, I'm not sure how complete the, new, the FBI center is mm -hmm. that they've been working on, but it looks like they're getting close. Well, we we know about the estimated number of jobs that that will that will that will infuse into our community. Um, we know that it's going to be a gradual infusion, meaning that we're not going to have three or four hundred people here immediately um, the the week after the building's ready for occupancy. That that will gradually happen over a period of years, and so. Um, how that will impact us by way of the makeup of the individuals that either move into those positions or, or transport in via other locations that say they work for the FBI in, in other locations throughout the country. We don't know 
if they'll come in with high school age children or if they'll come in with primary age children or, or what. And we're just going to have to kind of take that in stride as we go. I, I think that we'll see those reflected in our numbers year by year over the next three years. But, um, you know, 400 people moving in when you look at the average number of the average size of families um, and the number of children that they have in there, which is not as many as it was 25 years ago, um, we should be able to absorb them, and we'll just have to look and, and see how that how that happens. So it, it's anyone's guess at this point in time. We really can't fret about it too much, but we need to be prepared as much as we possibly can. Okay, that concludes my report. Thank you. Mr. Smart, what We've already touched up on one of my topics tonight, so we won't even have to go there, will we? Um, just three short items for you tonight from my section of the agenda. Um, of course, uh, every opportunity we get, we like to let you know if there's anything coming down the pike in the way of uh, infant campus or IC or, or uh, technology updates. And... Uh, <clears throat> I guess the most obvious technology update you can see right now is the one above your head. And, uh, of course, uh, with uh, the change in the, uh, the city's video services, uh, we went to our own video service and broadcasting over fa Facebook. Yeah, I think we're recording. Are we on YouTube? Right now we're recording. Yeah. Courtney wanted me to record. Okay, we're recording. So anyway, that's that's new for us. So uh, we're not live, and so. Uh, uh, so we can edit it. Well, I wasn't going to go there, but if there's a real if there's a real faux pas, that maybe yeah, some could be uh, could handle that way. And so uh, that's why we have Kevin here tonight to make sure everything looks and runs like it should. Um. As far as any other technology or infinite campus updates, I don't really have anything for you, to, for you other than to tell you that uh, we did get our first IC submission out the door this uh, last week. In fact, did a day and a half early. So, uh, of course, there will be things to clean up as we get into the data, and, and uh, so we will we'll have an, uh, about six weeks to deal with that. The good news is... Um, uh, we're close, closing in on our first reporting period, or the end of our first reporting period, which is the first Friday in November. And uh, that kind of leads me into the next section, uh, which is attendance. But uh, after that, that attendance window closes, then we have to go through all the reports and we have to fix misassignments and some odds and ends like those that we might have through ICO through the month of December. So we will be doing that. But... Uh, on the flip side, when we talk about attendance, <clears throat> you have our, your attendance reports, and you already talked about them a little bit tonight. Um, when you look at where we stand in relation to where we thought we were going to be last spring as we created our budget, you know, of course, we, we do a, a wild guess. I'll have to be honest. It's a guess. Scientific, of course. But... Uh, <clears throat> uh, trying to determine how many units we should be funded for. And right now, uh, according to this latest attendance report or membership report you have in your packet tonight, we actually have just about 100 kids more than we thought we were going to have, the bulk of them in elementary schools. And so it changes our, um, our funding a little bit. And as I mentioned, the first f Friday in November is that cut off. And so we can probably take it to the bank. We're going to have between three, three and a half more units than we thought we were going to have last, last spring for a salary apportionment. So that's the good news. We're not going to be short. So, um, and I'm not going to go through a lot of that other tennis data in great detail. So you have, unless you have other questions, we can move on to the last item on my section of the agenda. Kind of just maybe a commendation for Mr. Smart and the team, uh, Joel Berkman and uh, Tiffany uh, in special education. You know, it was a new format this year, 
uh, start and categories and assignment codes and things were very much different. For IC? Yes, for IC reporting. And so with thousands of errors, um, Carl and his group managed to get that cleaned up and still uh, processed and submitted ahead of time. So, and there literally were thousands of errors. Tiffany, she uh, she she had a, a pretty what how do I want to put this? Her job was kind of double this year because she had to kind of marry two different systems to get to her data because they're in the transition to going to a new uh, special ed system, and so she was working two systems to try to make it all come together, and she did a heck of a job. To make that happen so uh, we had that conversation yesterday and, and so she uh, she deserves a lot of credit for what she had to go through this this time around for her special ed submissions I'll just add you would never know Tiffany's always smiling she must yeah. stressed I had no idea <laughs> I told me so you're amazing because you hide it well <laughs> yeah, <I just laughs> and uh the last thing on my section of the agenda is our wellness dashboard. You have that in front of you. Not a lot of changes from the previous month. And uh, the important numbers we like to look at are the loss experiences yeah. on the back page. Uh, in talking to Shauna, who puts this together, she says uh, our medical a year ago was about 100 and, I thought she said 122%. So we're better than we were a year ago. How did uh, you get 100 we spent $100 and, uh, to 100 basically that's what it was. They're guaranteeing, they'd like us to be at 80, right? right. Yeah. They'd be at 80 and uh, they pay us 100 we pay them 100 and we're 108 Yes. Basically that's it. So we're 28% over. Okay. If it continues like that, then we're going to have a big increase again. And uh, that's yeah. So, you know, hence that our, our fairly significant increase we had this year. So, yeah, Mr. Matson's right. For every dollar they get in premium from us, they paid out $108. And for every $100 in premium, they paid out $108 in, in, in reimbursement to the providers. <coughs> now, now, one thing I just want to add to this, and it's something that you, you've asked over the last couple or three months. I noticed in the news today that Regents Blue Shield has finally had a, or have finally has a contract with the emergency room doctors up here to Portneuf. So uh, things are starting to move. I, I didn't have a chance to ask about Port, uh, Pacific Source. But I knew, do know that uh, re, that Blue Cross of Idaho does now have a contract with those those physicians. Good for lots of people. So, uh, so I will find out what we can and may, maybe shoot you an email so you can have that information. But things are starting to move up there. So, with that, that will conclude my report. And I, unless you have other questions or comments. Okay, so for the HR reports, um, do you remember that we had a math teacher from Highland that was going to resign at the end of the first try? They have found an excellent replacement, um, uh, Jason Hebden, and um, he has been doing tutoring for our high school kids in their upper division math classes um, on the outside for the last five, six years at least. Um, knows knows our system, knows our kids, um, he's, he'll be an excellent replacement. Um, we have a math teacher from Alameda who resigned uh, as of the 3rd of October. And um, on the addendum, you'll notice that they have a, a math teacher that they would like to hire. She's a student teacher currently, um, has been working with our math teacher at Alameda and has been doing a fantastic job. Um, so we're going to be requesting an alternative authorization for her. Um, she has just her student teaching left to finish, and she will be done with that in December, and then she'll be good to go. But um, we need to get a, a content specialist for her. Um, and then we have an alternative authorization for a teacher over at Lewis and Clark. Um, and Mr. Smart told you that our IC upload went really well. We had a few things that, because they changed codes on 
credentials, all of a sudden we have teachers that can't teach what they've been teaching for the last five years. So um, we have a teacher at Lewis and Clark who has a special ed credential, a K-12 K generalist, and she's been teaching fifth grade for us for the last five years, and now they're saying, well, she needs to have a K-8 credential. So we're going to apply for a teacher to new endorsement for her um, to get her her K-8 credential. Um, yeah, it was loads of fun. The, we had one early childhood teacher um, coded on ours, had a copy of her certificate. It said early childhood, and they said she can't teach kindergarten. We went digging. Um, they no longer used that code, so they reassigned it to be school counselor. So on the State Department's website, her credential is in school counseling instead of early childhood. So... And she's a kindergarten teacher. And the paper I have in my hand says, you know, early childhood. So, so, so everybody's having this nice Yes. They all this yes. Stuff. Yes. Um, the other one that we're, we're just going nuts with is um, we have all subject K-8 teachers teaching uh, middle school health and PE, which they've always been able to do until this year. Now they have to have a K-12 health credential or a K-12 PE credential. Um, so the, the State Department's working on that one because they said, uh, oops, that's, something's not right there. So, it, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not us, it's not, it's, but it, it's been interesting because they've been reusing codes that they haven't used for a while and they're assigning them to other people, but. It's too bad we can't charge the State Department all the extra time it costs. Yeah, 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 that'd be nice. So. Um, Maybe they wouldn't do it so often. It's, yeah, it, it's been fun. Um, and then we have uh, some stipends to um, request action on um, for uh, some of our professionals that are teaching classes for our other teachers. And then last but not least, we are requesting a revision in kinds and levels. Um, and Renee, I'm going to apologize to you right now because I did forget one. Um, we did a, a wage study um, for all of our classified positions. And um, we had several positions that were significantly underpaid, not only at the low end, our starting rate, but also at the high end. Um, and so at the beginning of this year, we um, extended our kinds and levels charts out another five years. So we caught up on the high end on a few of them. But we still have. Um, three or four positions that are absolutely ridiculously underpaid. Um, and uh, I will give you an example. We've been trying to hire a lead food service driver for four weeks now. Uh, and the amount we pay is 3 to $4 less an hour than they can get working at any other driving job. So um, we're going to request that um, we move our food service delivery driver and our uh, food service delivery driver uh, and our stock clerk truck driver up to a level three. Um, and then our lead driver receiving clerk from a level three to a level five. That jump is simply because that person is responsible for millions of dollars of um, food service inventory. And they have to start work at three o'clock in the morning. And to, to, that's, that's to meet deliveries. So it is a, a significantly more responsibility than, than just a regular food service driver. Um, so we would like to compensate them and be able to, to offer a wage that we could hire somebody and keep somebody for more than a week and a half or two weeks. Um, the one I forgot, Renee, and I apologize right now, um, our receiving clerk is a level three. And that is another one of those that is significantly underpaid, and we'd like to move them to a level four. What's, what's this database manager? That's what we're going to that one next. So um, technology has, uh, they, they have application specialists, um, and they deal with, and, and Kevin, you can jump in whenever you want to. Uh, they deal with all the applications that we run through the district. So Infinite Campus, um, the... I station. Yes, please. Be my guest. Uh, 
So our application specialists are employees who deal with front-facing um, applications. So iStation, Infinite Campus, um, could, there's a ton of them. But any forward-facing application that a staff member would use, they we, have, we have an application specialist that's assigned to it. So that way if a teacher calls, um, they have someone to go to. They're also in charge of rostering and managing all of that part of it, as well as being on our help desk. So they answer the individual techno technology questions that they see. Um, and then a lot of other duties is assigned okay. for them. So <laughs> when we, we um, had a security, the security person opened that, that job, sorry, that we talked to you about last month, um, one of our application specialists got that job, so that job was opened. When we started looking at what technology really needed, what they really <coughs> need is a database manager to make sure that all of our information in our database is clean, it's um, put in correctly, it can be accessed, it can be, um, it, it can be, it's, it's consistent and managed. Um, and so the request was, could we hire a database manager instead of an application specialist? I said, okay, what does that entail? It's a whole lot more knowledge and a whole lot more responsibility. Could we pay them one step up? I said, well, I will ask the board and find out. Um, but it is, uh, so th what they're doing, instead of hiring another um, application specialist, they would like to hire a database manager. They have hired somebody for that position right now. We're paying them at the application specialist, but the responsibility and the knowledge base needed is significantly higher. Um, and so we would like to pay them instead of on level 10 to pay them on a level 11. Uh, the difference for all of those changes that I talked to you about is about $7,700. Um, and it, it would help. An annual salary? An annual salary. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. um, it's, it doesn't sound like much to us, but, but when you take a driver and, and give them a $1.50 an hour raise, it's a significant raise. And so... Uh, and we can attract and hopefully keep, because the training that's involved in that food service driving spe ex, uh, especially is significant, and it, having turnover in there is difficult. So, I think we so the problems so, that arise from Yes. <laughs> well, and just being able to find somebody to, to, to be able to, that's willing to do that. Um, 3.30 in there, 3 o'clock in the morning, and throwing freight. Um, and if there's deliveries on the weekends, they, they are the people that are there on the weekends to meet freight too. So, and we have deliveries that come in regularly on the weekends, so. Okay, then we'll just have you approve that. Um, I have to start with the amended. With that amended? Okay. Um, but, but, no, you, you changed four titles on here. Yes. I, I feel that there is... 25 more that we're, we're looking at them. Yeah. These okay. are the ones, no, 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 the, no. This, these are the ones that were significantly mm -hmm. underpaid. We just, okay. there's, we're, we're close on some, we're farther away on others. These we were not even in the ballpark for. Okay. So. so should we expect more then? Um, I don't know, if right now or in February, March, when we look at, um, that's when I'd like to do a, because we need to do another analysis and see how outside right now. Maybe if you were doing this kind of like a piecemeal little time analysis like this. We yeah. This month. No. Next no. month there's going to be a couple of more because we're still because busy. we're still chewing that elephant down. That's right. Yeah. I know <laughs> um, how hard this is. Uh, we, we like I said we started with the significant, sure. um, and then hope to propose some raises. And you know what I might tell as well is. You know, we tried to do some things with mm -hmm. the salary schedule this year. It might be another boost to next year. Mm -hmm. so try to do some of those things. Yeah. So, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now we're on to the superintendent's report, and we're starting with the district strategic plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, those first three items for you, district strategic plan for uh, 18 through 2021, that seems kind of strange just saying that, but um, it was. Uh, and then the operating principles and the code of ethics for school board members. Uh, we talked about those and discussed them at our board retreat uh, earlier. And so unless you have any 
questions or additional discussion that you would like to add tonight, uh, all of those would be heard, uh, well, not heard but uh, uh, for your approval and your old business. The uh, fourth item for me tonight is the uh, amended board meeting schedule, and we touched on that a little bit earlier tonight as well. And uh, that would be to um, cancel the November work session so that we could uh, attend a tour with Mrs. Naffs and regarding the CTE programs in the Treasure Valley area. And so again, that's under old business tonight. What time will be leaving? I visited with Mrs. Naffs this morning and asked her to finalize the details for us, but I would imagine it would be by between 7 and 8 o'clock. Yeah, I saw that and I saw 10.30. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we going to get it all in? <laughs> yeah, right. So, I, again, I just talked to her this morning and uh, she had been away for a time, uh, a son with a wedding. And then she's off to Coeur d'Alene for a conference tomorrow, but she will have that to me and I'll give it to you right away. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, uh, let's see, your board calendar. We've got a lot of strategic plan to pass. What is that? Uh, I'm on 115. 115. Let me just get the plug in the manual. So uh, we have uh, potentially some student discipline hearings next Wednesday. And um, again, we won't know if we'll hold those or not. It's all depending on uh, Wednesday's <laughs> DERC schedule and what comes from uh, the recommendations from that committee. And then you can see November 5th, uh, Mr. Manson and the Foundation Board meeting November 6th. Election day, and then you now did we reschedule board visits for them? Uh, so we're not going on the election day. Oh, yeah. No, didn't Okay, I was thinking I saw one today for later in the so week. So that or was else. because I do you remember like a month ago, Jenny said she's going to be at a conference. Oh, and uh -huh. then Jamie said that would be fine to reschedule, and you sent me something, and then I just never okay. So I kind of did that today. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, to get that changed. So that was rescheduled. I, I, maybe we should look at rescheduling. the other two? Is that going to be too hectic for everybody? I think we, we talked about that because of pulling them a bunch of places. Uh -huh. uh, Highland would not be a problem. Uh, I, Ellis would be tight. Well, Ellis is Ellis we're already. Friday. Yeah. 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 So for just Friday. Highland and Tyke. So we'll check on Taihe, Mrs. Okay. Craner, Mr. Kirch. Okay, let me let me follow up on those. Okay. Okay. And then the student discipline hearings again every other week would take us to November seventh. The ninth local issues for Mr. Vitali, Mr. Madison. November eleventh, uh, Veterans Day, and then uh, we'll get you a schedule. Uh, historically, we've had some veteran program day programs. Uh, sometimes the Friday before, if it falls on a weekend, or the Monday after, so we will let you know. And then that takes us to November 13th with that CTE program tour, if the board uh, adjusts the calendar tonight. And then we have ISB convention Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the 14th through the 16th. Well. And there's one other change we made today. We learned that Judge Murray's meeting will be on the 13th. And he said, well, I hope Mr. Hobbs will be up the meeting. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, down here you have the uh, Festival of Trees Gala. Do you need to know about our spouses? Um, just email probably, but just I think the sooner that Courtney has members, the better. So. Okay. So we can update that. Uh -huh. our, and our available. Yes, we'll follow up. And then the employee appreciation is that Wednesday. So we'll plan for two events. Yeah. <coughs> okay. I didn't have the schedule with all of the sandwich and royalty yeah. yet, so those are not there. But okay. when I get them, I will have them. Okay. Okay, that concludes your part. That's it. Okay. Uh, we're at the point now for public comment and uh, no public. <laughs> and we've heard from you already. Yeah, so so. Yeah. so we will.
uh, go on <coughs> to our consent agenda, and I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda, which includes to, uh, um, to authorize the payment of claims, to approve the supplemental financial information, and to approve the human resource activity. I move that we uh, approve the consent agenda. I will second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, under old business, I would entertain a motion to hear on second reading for adoption policy 8705. And do I do all of these at once? Can I? I just one at a time. Yeah, I think that's what I can do. I move that we approve uh, policy, uh, uh, second reading for adoption policy 8705. I'll second Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The next item under old business is to approve those out of state and overnight travel requests. There were two. I move that we approve the out of state and overnight travel requests. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next item under old business is to approve the financial audit management letter and direct and direct submission to PCCS. I move that we approve that financial audit management letter and direct its submission to PCCS. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the next item uh, under old business is to approve the district strategic plan from 2018 to 2021. I move we approve the uh, district strategic plan. Also. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The next <coughs> item is to uh, affirm the Board of Trustees operating principles. I move that we affirm the Board of Trustees operating principles. One well, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next item is to affirm the code of ethics for the school board members. I move that we affirm the code of ethics for school board members. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The next item under old business, or the last item, I guess is to adopt the amended board meeting schedule 2018 18 we approve that amended board meeting schedule for 2018. I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The under new business, uh, the first item of, uh, is to accept the Pocatello Chubby School District Number 25 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018 and certify the annual financial condition statements. I move that we accept uh, the Polk College Chuck School District Number 25 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for fiscal year ended June 30th, 2018 and certify the annual financial condition statements. I second that. Any discussion? Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations to them again. All in favor? Aye. 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 The next item is to approve the 2018-19 State Technical Assistance Team assurances for uh, CSI public schools. I move that we approve the 2018-19 uh, State Technical Assistance Team assurances for CSI public schools. I second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The next item is to grant permission to bid 2019-20 SIP related projects. I move that we grant permission to bid 2019-20 SIP related projects. It seems so funny to be Is there a second? second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, and the last item is to approve the revised classified kinds and levels chart with the addition of the receiving report. Uh, I move that we approve revised classified kinds and levels chart. With? with oh, yeah, with the addition. Of the, the state. Uh, Which one was it? The receiving clerk. The receiving clerk. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I second. I, I, Teamed out by the <laughs> 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 Is there any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> okay, that concludes all of the business. Uh, anyone have any announcements? Yes, I have two. Oh, One okay. is um, that Ken Hobbs was honored at the NAACP banquet on Saturday night for his work in the community. So a nice special award for him. And then a reminder that the Bannock Development Meeting is, I think, on the 18th. Anyway, it's coming up. Right. That is the symposium? Mm -hmm. Yes. That is the Wednesday the 24th or something? Uh, Hold on. I wrote it on my calendar. Yeah, it's Wednesday. Yeah, it's a Wednesday, so it's next. Okay. It's on the 24th. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to all in favor? Aye. Aye. Kevin, thank you. Yeah. Did it run pretty smoothly? Seems to. Okay. Now we'll just uh, see what happens. Okay. If Courtney wants to upload it, and I know she wants to do live uh, for the next one, uh -huh. so I'm hoping to have that 100% ironed out before then. Okay. So okay. we should be good. Well, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it.